thanks very much. And, uh, I'll start with Pete and with Pete's diary and the entry on the 8th of March, 1665. This morning has brought me to the office the sad news of the London in which Sir John Lawson's men were all bringing her from Chatham to the Hope, and thence he was to go to sea in her. But a little of this side, the boy of the north, she suddenly blew up. About twenty-four and a woman that were in the roundhouse and coach saved, the rest being about three hundred drowned, the ship breaking all in pieces with eighty pieces of brass ordnance. She lies sunk with her roundhouse above water. Sir John Lawson had a great loss in this of so many good chosen men um, and many relations among them. So that's how Pete's recorded the loss of the London. And I should actually have brought up this particular uh, slide at that point, which is a page from Pete's diary. Not that particular page, uh, but this is a sample of it. Of course, as you may know, Pete's wrote his diary in this very bizarre shorthand um, possibly to conceal some of his naughtier goings on. For the really naughty goings on, he used a bit of a double disguise and had this invented cross between various European languages to try to cover up the really, really naughty bits, and there were plenty of those. Now, Richard has talked about the construction of the London. He's already shown you uh, this image, which is meant to be of the London ready to go off on her first voyage. Well, maybe it was, but they clearly something's been done to this um, image later on because if you look closely, it's actually got the royal arms on the stern, which it wouldn't have had when the ship was built. It would be something probably much closer to the, uh, the protectorate um, arms that, that was there originally. John's already referred to the great expansion of the navy under the Commonwealth, and this did continue under Cromwell. At the time that the London is built, it's the war with Spain, which has involved the acquisition of Jamaica, the Western design, and that is the context in which the London was built. Just think about the name for a moment. John mentioned there had been a previous London, but that was a much smaller ship. It was an East Indiaman that had been bought into the Navy. This London, or London, is the first major British warship to be named after a town or city by the state. Yeah, there are plenty of ships that are named after places under the Commonwealth, under that big construction program, but they're invariably named after battles. The most famous of them, of course, being the greatest of all Cromwell ships, the Navy, which becomes the Royal Charles, the Restoration. This is the first time the name London is, is used and I think there's a very clear reason for this. As mentioned earlier, the City of London had been absolutely critical to Parliament's success in the Civil War. The manpower, the resources, the wealth. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Parliament couldn't have won the Civil War uh, without London. Pepys probably encounters her for the first time in May 1659, when he goes out with dispatches for his boss, this gentleman, Edward Montague, um, in the left, in the clothes of the, the, the robes of the Order of the Garter, which he was given in 1660, together with the title of Earl of Sandwich. Um, and yes, it is from one of his descendants that we get what we're probably going to be having at lunchtime very shortly. Um, and in the right, on the right there, in somewhat more martial garb. As was mentioned, Pepys and Montague very, very closely connected from Huntingdon, and it's Montague who's given Pepys his job. In 1659, Montague was commanding the fleet in the Baltic, and Pepys, as I say, goes out to take dispatches to him. He's only there very briefly. Montague is flying his flag in the Naseby, the biggest of all the ships. The London is with him with um, Sir Richard Stainer, one of the uh, flag officers that period in command of her. Why is it in the Baltic? It's in the Baltic because there's an ongoing war between Denmark and Sweden. That war is of huge interest to the government, to Cromwell, 
because of course it's from the Baltic that you get a lot of the naval supplies that are absolutely vital to the construction of ships and, and the maintenance of ships like the London. So the, the fleet of the Montague has gone out in a deterrent role. And that is actually a very important part of why all these ships are built and the Commonwealth period and why the London is built. Yes, big warships are meant to fight as a last resort. But short of fighting, of course, what they're meant to do then as now is to deter and to impress. And they send this fleet out to actually act as a signal. Look, we are here, we have these very large, very impressive, very powerful ships. We are keeping an eye on things. In the following year, May 1660, Pepys encounters her again because she's part of the fleet sent a very famous occasion to the coast of Holland. She'll be in that little batch up there somewhere. When Charles II is restored, he's been in exile in Holland, and he goes back to England, taken up from the beach, and of course pretty much the first thing he does when he gets into the fleet is to rename the Naseby, reminder of his dad's worst defeat, no, we're not keeping that on, and it becomes the Royal Charles instead, partly named after his dad, partly named after himself. Charles II didn't do modesty. Um, at one point in the 16th century, he's actually got five warships which have got the name Charles in the name of the ship somewhere. Um, so, Pinks encounters the London again at this particular point. But obviously, London was one of the ones that didn't need to be renamed at the Restoration, unlike so many of the others that were named after battles, parliamentarian victories. There's quite a little known voyage of the London in January 1661, when she embarks these two ladies. The one on the left is Queen Henrietta Maria, the widow of the executed Charles I, the mother of Charles II. So she is at that time <laughs> the Queen Mother. And the lady on the right is her daughter, Charles's favourite sister, Henrietta Anne. Now, ostensibly, the reason why they're going is Henrietta Anne is being married to the gentleman in the picture, uh, Philippe du Dorville, the brother of King Louis XIV. And if you saw the BBC series Versailles, you will know that Philippe Duc de Orléans is a rather interesting individual, uh, to say the least, who particularly liked dressing up in women's clothes. Um, but that all lay ahead of poor old Henrietta. She, she had a terrible voyage on the, um, the London because she had measles uh, during the voyage, which wasn't brilliant. And the, the mother, her mother's going with her ostensibly to, you know, to help her settle in. Henrietta Maria, after all, was French um, herself. In fact, of course, by then she's had so many rubs with her son because Charles stubbornly doesn't do what she thinks he should be doing, um, you know, classic mother-son thing, that she goes off in a huff and spends the rest of her life uh, living in a sort of self-imposed exile in France. Then the London is laid up in ordinary, um, as was mentioned earlier on by Richard, so she is effectively in reserve, um, no top mass, etc., just a small skeleton crew aboard. This is a view of uh, the River Medway from the other end, as it were, looking from Chatham towards Rochester Bridge again, which you can see at the top right, with uh, Rochester Castle and Rochester Cathedral shown there as well. So the London spends most of the next few years laid up in ordinary in this way. By early 1665, though, she's been brought into commission for another war with the Dutch, a second war. John referred to the first one, and they are continuing economic rivalries, colonial rivalries, and in fact, the fighting has already begun by the beginning of 1665. Notably, the English have already taken this small and insignificant Dutch colony, then named New Amsterdam. The gentleman who captures it, Colonel Richard Nichols, is part of the household of Charles II's brother, James Duke of York, and of course renames it in honour of him, New York. And there, sorry, let's go back to that, on the right, is the memorial to Colonel Richard Nichols in the church in Bedfordshire, quite close to where we live. And the thing you can see just in the top, if you can make it out between the two flags of two countries, is the cannonball that killed him. 
<laughs> and it is literally the cannonball that killed him. And I wondered, every time I went to see this monument, I wondered for years, how on earth did they get the exact cannonball? And then I found a letter which explained that apparently he was wearing a very thick leather jacket. And the cannonball must have been about at the end of its trajectory because it went into him and didn't come out through the jacket, lodged in the jacket. So there you go, this is one of the joys of studying history. But, of course, <laughs> as a result of incidents like this, uh, the Second Anglo-Dutch War begins. And London is brought into commission for fighting like this. This is how the battle is going to be fought. The line of battle tactic, where this has been adopted at the Battle of the Gabbard, again referred to by John, that the English fleet now fought in a line ahead to maximise the power of the broadside. The guns down the side of the ship that we've seen from uh, Richard talking about the design of it. And so that was the expectation of what the London would do. She was, of course, going to be the flagship of this gentleman, Sir John Lawson. Now, Lawson is a very, very interesting character, to say the least. He's a Yorkshireman. He'd been a merchant shipmaster, merchant ship owner. He, a bit like Cromwell, really, had worked up from pretty humble beginnings and made a success through his own merits. He had become a very successful naval officer in the first Anglo-Dutch War. However, he was regarded as being very, very radical, politically and religiously. He was right on the, the fringe end of all these religious sects and groups who are out there. But at some point over the winter of 1659-60, he is converted to the idea of the restoration of the monarchy. Now, we don't know exactly how he comes to this road to Damascus moment. It, it is possible that there might have been sums of money involved. There are various other possibilities. It, it may well be that he realised, as Montague realised, Montague by then was um, his, his commanding officer, that there is no alternative. The only way you can have stable government in the country is to get the king back. Um, either way, Lawson, like Montague, benefits hugely from the new regime. He's knighted, and in 1665, he is going to be the vice admiral of the fleet. Um, because he's from Yorkshire, of course, and because you know there's, there's this myth of the press gang that they're all pressed, no, they weren't, particularly in the 17th century. Most of the sailors are volunteers. They want to serve under captains they know and respect, and therefore this is Pepys's reference in the diary. A lot of the crew of the London would have been Yorkshiremen, and he does mention explicitly that you know members of Lawson's extended family and people you know who are part of his circle are killed in the explosion. So it would have been a great personal loss to Lawson, not just the ship but the loss of people who he knew and quite possible, possibly people that he loved as well. Now, I'm going to say something a little bit controversial. Now, that isn't the London going up. The, the, uh, that, that is um, a Swedish ship blowing up about 50 years later. But, you know, it may have well have looked something a little bit like that. In one sense, and in one sense only, the loss of the London wasn't necessarily a hugely damaging incident for the Navy at that time. Two big new second rates, the Royal Catherine and Royal Oak, were just coming into service um, and they, uh, in, a, in a sense, take on the, the, the role that the, the London would have, have played. It's you lose the ship, okay, as Richard has said, you can build another ship in fairly quick time, as is demonstrated by the replacement of Loyal London, which I'll talk a bit more about again in a minute. Um, the damage, really, is done by the loss of the guns. 
And this would be even more marked in the following year, 1666, where in very short order, the English lose a couple of big ships, including one of the biggest of all, the, the, the Royal Prince. And that is what is really, really damaging. They used to say in the Second World War, didn't they, that losing a Spitfire wasn't a problem because you could build new Spitfires very, very quickly. It's a similar principle to that. The pilots were what mattered with the warships of the 17th century. It's not the ship as such. It's not the men, callous as that may sound. It's the guns. They are the critical loss when one of these ships is lost. And of course, even without the London, when the first battle of the war happens a few weeks later, on the 3rd of June 1665, the Battle of Lowestoft, it's an absolutely thumping English victory. I hope history doesn't repeat itself this afternoon. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, it, you know, the, the line of battle works very, very well, um, and the Dutch fleet is really put to to flight. And oddly enough, um, there's an almost, almost exact repetition of this very scene in the Battle of Lowestoft. The Dutch flagship Eindracht blows up in the middle of the battle. So you have these two enormous explosions of great ships within literally a few weeks of each other in 1665. Now, I mentioned that a replacement ship was soon announced um, and within literally a few days of the loss of the London, the City of London comes forward and says they will fund the, uh, a replacement, they will pay for a new London. Charles II is so chuffed by this, I not having to pay for something himself, <laughs> which he always hated, um, that he christens the ship the Loyal London. And of course, there's actually a wonderful double meaning in that, because it's not just the loyalty that the City of London has now displayed by stumping up the cash, it's the fact that London is now seen to be loyal, it's seen to be politically loyal, which of course hadn't been the case in the, in the Civil War. Unfortunately, the new loyal London doesn't last for very long, because this is the Dutch attack on the Medway, in 1667, and the Loyal London is one of the great ships that's actually destroyed in that action. The most famous scene, of course, is when the Dutch tow away the Royal Charles, the greatest ship, the former Naseby. And if you go to the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam, you can still see the stern piece up there, the major display because the Dutch. I still pretty chuffed about all of that, as you know. So. <laughs> um, another London is then launched in 1670. And the interesting thing is that after this, the name London is virtually an ever present in the Royal <laughs> Navy. If you go through different periods of naval history, there has always been an Air London. It's one of the most used and repeated names in the whole of British naval history. Oddly, we're currently living through the second longest period when there hasn't been an HMS London in the Royal Navy. But that will be changing very soon because they have ordered a new HMS London, um, a frigate, which will be coming into service in a few years time. And it occurs to me that when that frigate is in service, it might be a very handy affiliation for this particular campaign to have. So, I would suggest that the impact of the loss of the London in many respects was more psychological. Because, of course, when people look back with hindsight, it seemed to be the first of the great disasters which befell England in the 1660s, in the mid-1660s, the plague of 1665, the Great Fire of London in 1666, the Dutch in the Medway in 1667. You know, you've got this string of disasters back to back, and arguably you could put the London, the loss of the London, in before all three of those as a harbinger of what's to come. And there's a suggestion of that in 
these lines by contemporary of Pepys's, Andrew Marvell. Now, Marvell uh, didn't have a lot of time for the court of King Charles II, um, and he also didn't have a lot of time for the old adage that you don't deploy sarcasm. Uh, pretty much every word that Marvell writes drips with sarcasm, <laughs> including these lines about the loss of the London. Next, let the flaming London come in view, like Nero's Rome burned to rebuild it new. What lesser sacrifice than this was meet to offer for the safety of the fleet? Blow one ship up, another thence does grow. See what free cities and wise courts can do. <laughs> On which note I shall finish, but not without some blatant advertising. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the reason why of my uh, fiction titles, I focus on the glass that tears the skies, is that that does contain the loss of the London. Um, it's the first of the two glass, obviously, and the other one is the lo loss of the aim draft I referred to earlier on. Um, and strangely, I do have some copies <laughs> <laughs> later on. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>